Logocentrifugal podcast. I am Chance Lunsford and Logocentrifugal. I'll let you work out the math. I'm here with my special guest, Dr. Ralph Napolitano. Welcome and tell the people a little bit about yourself, Dr. Ralph. Hey, my brother. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is pretty cool. I always, it always kind of fascinates me that somebody wants to interview me. <laughs> so I'm like, really? Okay. So it's pretty cool to, to do something like this. Um, let me see. Where, where should I start about myself? Uh, I'm a fourth generation restaurateur. Let's start there. Um, my great grandparents uh, opened up a restaurant in 1927 uh, here in the Bronx, New York. And the, little, the real Little Italy of New York, the real one, is in the Bronx, not in Manhattan. So if you, want to come to, if you come to New York and you want to see the real Little Italy, you come up to see me in the Bronx, me and my brother Anthony. Uh, he's the chef. Um, that's, that's my older brother. He's, he's my, one of my big-time mentors. And talk about an old school guy. We'll, we'll talk about him a little bit, but <laughs> that's the old school guy for sure. Uh, I'm also a practicing chiropractor. I've been practicing chiropractic for almost 20 years now. Um, um, I, I'm a father. This is one of my proudest things, uh, achievements without a doubt. I have three beautiful kids, two daughters that are 16 and 14, and my son is 13, and they are my absolute world. And my father lived his life for me and my brother. I live my life and, and try to live a certain way f for them to just carry on that legacy. So, um, I mean, I, I, I started a Twitter account uh, like in uh, uh, like June of 2018 um, just because I wanted a place to just vent my own shit. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm divorced also. I've been divorced for, for, oh my God, what is it? Four years? It'll be five years, four years, whatever. Four years or five years. Um, and, you know, just going through all the nonsense, you, kind of craziness you go through, trying to find yourself and what the fuck did you do wrong? And, and then you realize you really didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> and let's, let's start right there because back in November, we actually did uh, me, I had myself, Ed Lattimore, and Alexander Cortez, we actually did a seminar here in New York, uh, Old School Mental Toughness for New World Domination. We did a one-day seminar. Mm -hmm. And probably going to try and do it again at the end of November if my schedule is kind of crazy. And I kind of, you know, the basis of it, of the seminar was, I talked about my divorce and um, things that happened along, along that path. And the realization at the end, what I came to is, you know, a lot of the talk that you see in, around the manosphere stuff, red pill craziness, whatever it is. Oh, you know, you, you, you kind of, uh, you need to improve yourself. You need to transform your life. You need to become a better person and all this kind of shit. And the one thing I realized when it all comes full circle is probably I really walked away from incrementally in my marriage who I was as my own person, mm -hmm. as my own man, with my own uh, mission and my own um, way of life. And the reason why I did it was sort of like submission or um, a way to just not be so aggressive in my relationship. Mm -hmm. And I kind of backed off of a lot of the things that I even talk about on my Twitter. and. I kind of, I guess I became some type of a different kind of a person, not on purpose. It just kind of, you, you didn't want to put any pressure on other people. I didn't want to put pressure on my, on my wife that I had, you know, my children, all these kind of things. And of course, it's also the other stuff, be the nice guy with the woman, all that kind of craziness. And I, I bought into that, that kind of stuff. And I guess that's why, um, Probably the reason why I'm divorced is because I just, I, not that I became a, that I needed to improve myself, is that I walked away from what my principles and my values, which I, I have strong principles and values. Me so too. I kind of, I kind of relented on them a little bit it, it, to uh, kind of satisfy the person I was with. So we wouldn't have to, you know, so she wouldn't feel less of a person. 
than I was. So I kind of like walked away from, I'm not trying to slide her. I don't want to, I don't want to come off as sounding um, bitter or, or like, you know, she's not a good person. That's, that's not true. But I just want to just kind of redo that. I had a very stable upbringing and family. I had, a, uh, you know, principles, values, things that you're supposed to do. Boom, boom. And, and I'm in, you know, no nonsense, no bullshit. I don't go for the norm of society. My family never went for it. We, we just, we, we didn't do that. So we, you know, just grew up that way. And that's where that kind of seminar we did kind of, kind of came from. And that's where my Twitter page kind of started. I just started tweeting out just different things. Um, and in that process, someone had told me about, and when I first put up my Twitter page, my profile was, I had this smiley picture with my profile said, that, Oh, I'm chiropractor and all this kind of shit on it that nobody really was, was interested. <laughs> so I just was tweeting out my stuff and, and, uh, and what I was really tweeting was more of my spiritual side, which I do have. I know it. If you follow my Twitter page, you would think I, I'm, I'm definitely not a, spiritual, a, a spiritually grounded person. You would think this guy is just some fucking asshole just screaming, <laughs> calling people whatever and saying I should do this and shut the fuck up and don't be a, a pansy and uh, you know all this kind of craziness. But um, I, I'm a very spiritually grounded person and that definitely comes from my upbringing with my family and then it translates into my chiropractic uh, education because that's the one thing you have to learn is we are no different than nature. We are connected to it. And we are one with it. When we start to walk away from, we got our technology. Look at it. Me and you are talking right now on this phone, right? I'm in the Bronx, New York. Where are you? I don't know. Where are you? Where are you? I'm in Utah, dude. You're in friggin' Utah. <laughs> Utah, Bronx, New York. I got a cell phone in my hand. I see you. We could talk to each other. You're recording this. Other people are going to see it. So we kind of start getting disconnected from nature as one with it. And we walk away from it and we think we're different beings or we're better than it. And that's just not what, and really, that's really my basis. But going forward, when I started my Twitter page, um, really was talking a lot of spiritual, crazy mumbo jumbo and, uh, and craziness. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, which I, you know, I still fully believe in, but you have to also, but I also had in my, not my Twitter life in the beginning, but in my real life, I was in the spiritual stuff, but I understood the reality too, that red pill. Yeah, but you know, it's good to be connected, but there's also real life that you have to get up off your ass and do your thing and earn your keep and do all this kind of stuff. So in that process, someone gave me uh, Rolo Tomasi's book, Rational Mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some other divorce guy, it was one of my patients in my practice, gave it to me, said I should read this. So I kind of checked it out, started reading it, and then that's, I found Rolo on Twitter, hooked up with his Twitter, started listening to his stuff, started tweeting back at him, then he was tweeting at other people, and then I found all these, you know, red pill kind of guys and these kind, this kind of stuff, and, uh, and so now I started seeing the tweet going back and forth, and wow, a lot of these guys are saying what I believe, and it's true, and all this kind of stuff. And then I started, you know, kind of tweeting back at them. And then people started, you know, people with big accounts started retweeting my shit. And all of a sudden I started getting followers. Mm. And in the process, I kind of was still talking a little spiritual. And then I said, you know what, screw this. And I started really thinking about, hey, maybe I could grow a Twitter account and help and help people. I was really the... My, my process, uh, you know, coming from the restaurant business, from a, from a small child, going into the chiropractic world, obviously, I'm a, I'm a person who is here to serve others somehow, some way, to make their lives a little bit better, you know, so I kind of looked at my Twitter, I said, you know what, and one of the things I always talked about is, you know, you get older, I uh, would you know, old school this and old school that. And when the old school days, we didn't do this. So I said, you know, I should just put, you know, old school life lessons, whatever. And I try to kind of change my profile up and change my picture 
to some a black and white picture with like a mean look on my face but no smile. <laughs> little uh, life lessons from the real little Italy of New York. Once I changed that, then I started speaking in like my normal tone that I would speak to my friends with and even just every day. Yeah. I just said, I, I started writing like these spiritual tweets. I wrote them. Then I rewrote them in, <laughs> in the old school neighborhood, Arthur Avenue, Italian. <laughs> and then people really started retweeting it and liking it and replying to it. And, and I said, you know what? I, you know, what? I, I have to stick with, this is who I really am. You know, even though I'm the spiritual guy, but this is how I really convey that message. And it seems more believable coming from, I mean, if you hear my voice, you look at me, <laughs> hey, look at that gangster. I, got, I get that my whole life. Uh, so it kind of fit. And, and one of the things I talked about in that seminar was uh, to not be a fagazi. And a fagazi is, is, is a phony. It's basically not, not the real thing. So, uh, and the story I told was when I first started my chiropractic practice, when I first graduated, I, I graduated chiropractic school. Three months later, I was in my own practice, mm. opened up and just, I had really no idea what I was doing, but boom, and just went for it. Uh, made a lot of mistakes and fucked up a lot of shit. <laughs> uh, that's a whole nother, we could do one, you got another hour and a half for another podcast, all the fuck ups that I had. Um, so, What's but when I first saw it, what? We'll schedule it. Yeah, we'll schedule that one. <laughs> so what, what happened was when I started in that practice, I was like, you know, I was one of the first family members to, to get some type of professional education. My parents didn't go to college. My brother didn't. My brother went to college for one semester, and he went to college and studied restaurant management he was going to study. Mm. In his first class of introduction to restaurant <laughs> management, some guy, some professor, you know, all the stuff that talks about college, you know, everybody bashes college all over the Twitter shit. Some, some, my brother's working in the restaurant business since we're nine years old, basically. This college professor who's never worked a day, who was a busboy, some in a restaurant, is trying to tell the class how to run a restaurant. <laughs> my brother's in the middle of the class telling the guy, no, that's not how it's done. No, that's not how it's done. And my brother, the guy failed. My brother failed the class. <laughs> to the restaurant management. And my, my mom, my, he came home and he told my parents, I, I'm not going back there. This guy failed me. I, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So he quit, he quit college and he just stood in the restaurant. Uh, so now, I, you know, I'm the first one who has a professional degree. You're this professional now. You're a doctor now. Oh, everything has to change. You have to speak a certain way. You have to present yourself a certain way. You have to be serious now in life. You have to convey to your patients your knowledge <laughs> and how smart you are. And you have to use all these big words that you learn in, in, in chiropractic school. So now I go into my practice, I have the white coat on with my name, Dr. Ralph Napolitano, the tie on, all this kind of stuff. And I'm presenting myself in a very professional, professional doctor manner to my patients. And uh, on purpose, I'm doing it. I'm not really being me. Mm. Little by little, I notice like, you know, not really getting patients. Patients aren't coming back. I'm not liking this, this, this chiropractic stuff. I may, and I'm thinking I made a huge mistake. I went to school. I fucked up my life. This is not what I want to do. This is crazy. I, got, I'm not, I have to close the practice. I can't do this anymore. So I started thinking and I just went, you know what? Fuck this. I went into the office one day, took the white coat off, took the tie off. You know, I still wear nice clothes, nice pants, slacks, and nice shirt, whatever. But took everything off. And the first patient that walked in that day, there was a new patient. They sat down and I greeted them how I would greet my restaurant guests and customers mm -hmm. plain and simple i walked in the room <laughs> put out my head and hey how you doing nice to meet you what's going on where, how, where are you from where are you coming from that's what i started doing just started talking like the regular guy boom every everything started flowing
People started coming back. People wanted to know what was up. People started flowing into the practice. I felt better. It was great. I, and, and I, be, I fell in love with the chiropractic profession. And I said, you know what? What was I doing? I know how to service people. I've been doing it my whole life. Why now? Because I'm a doctor. I'm some big shot asshole. Nah. So I said, you know what? And, and I just stopped everything. And I just, and I still do that today in my practice. And it's funny because I do get overlap. Like I have some of my patients, you know, they find out I own the restaurant, they come to the restaurant and I have some people who've been in the restaurant who've become patients. And it's very funny because even though in my, in my professional practice, you know, you still greet people like a regular guy, but they still look at you like a doctor, you know, whatever. And they still, so you get some of the patients who come to my restaurant to eat. They bring their husbands, wives, their family, whatever. They walk in and now they see me. Now I'm really in the restaurant. I'm like, Hey, how you doing? It's now it's really gung ho. And they walk in and they go, it's like, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to greet me. <laughs> so I walk over to them. I grab them. I hug them. I kiss them. And they start introducing me as, you know, uh, this is, uh, this is Dr. Ralph Napoleon. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not tonight. Tonight we're drinking wine. We're eating food. No more doctor shit. And they look at me. Let's go. Let's go sit down. And it's like, you know, it's a different atmosphere. Then I get patients that people that come from my restaurant are coming to the office. <laughs> and then when they see me, hey, Ralph, what are you doing, bro? And they're shaking my hand, hugging me. So it's like you get this different, you treat it this different way. <laughs> Which I think is, is pretty cool. It's pretty, it's pretty funny. So I, 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 I feel truly blessed because I get to, you know, people come to my restaurant. I get to see all kinds of different people, interact with them and talk with them. Really get to know how people live. Um, get people come to my chiropractic practice who are in pain and struggling, who want a different way of life. People come into the restaurant, want a different experience. They want to feel good. People who come to the chiropractic practice want to feel good. So it's basically the same overlap. They kind of intertwine with each other, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. So I, I'm, I feel like one of the most blessed guys on the world that people actually want to come and show up to me <laughs> and you know, want my services and, and you get to meet so many different people. And then when you, in the restaurant business, when you get to serve people and they feel really good and they they're laughing and they're having a good time and, and they thank you for the experience and then they even pay you after they say thank you which is great and then the same thing in the chiropractic practice where you help somebody kind of transform their life that they've been struggling to find some answer to the problem that they've had and they and they've been to the medical doctors and they they can't find that answer and then when they come to you and you finally help them the slightest bit that they haven't been helped in, in 10 years. It's to them, it's the miracle of miracles. And it's like such a great feeling to actually help somebody to just, you know, help just change their life. I think it's, it's like an awesome thing. And then it kind of flows right over into my Twitter account. I feel the same way when I, when I send out my tweets, somebody sees it, somebody reads it, somebody might get a thought, change their life, whatever it might be. And I think that's really a cool thing to do. And that's one of my main mantras. If you follow my, my Twitter, you'll always see on my Twitter, always be of service, always add value to people's lives. That's what you put on this planet for. That's what you put here to do, period. I like that. There's a, there's a few things I w want to respond to. Go ahead. There's kind of a lot there to unpack, but yeah. so bear with me for a second. I'll try to. Try Absolutely. To so, you know, you talked about how service is, is a, is a compelling drive for you. Like that's yeah. the things that you circle around and how you view. Okay. So you start in the restaurant business and that's your family mm -hmm. business and you come up yep. with the hospitality situation in general, where it's like, Hey, you shake hands, you talk to people, you get to know them. How's it going? Where's you from? How's your family? Good to see you again. What's your name? I got your name. I got your name now. We got, you know, you develop that relationship with mm -hmm. people. I, restaurant a lot in my life i you know i've i've done pizza i've done barbecue i've done the sure. kinds of where you have regulars and people come and it's right. so you know hey bob how's it going here's here's your two beers and here's your chicken wings and we'll talk in a minute you know so oh. it, that's a cool feature and i agree with you that when you 
you know, it can be very easy working in the restaurant industry to become jaded by it and kind of lose touch with the fact that you're actually there to serve people. But if you yep. keep, it's, it's, it's really fulfilling to do that. Um, and then you talked about the chiropractic and how sick people are coming to you or they're, mm-hmm. they're ill or they're in pain or both. And, yep. and through a combination of things that you do, words that you use and techniques that you use and th- things that you suggest that they do when they start doing these things, their life comes back into alignment and yep. you know, they're able to take a deep breath for the first time in a long time, metaphorically and sometimes very literally. And yep. then that, and watching that stress melt off of somebody over time is very fulfilling. Yep. And, and I've had a lot of problems in my life. So I had to work very hard to overcome them. And I had to, I had to have a lot of people who were there to work with me you know I had to do the work but I had a lot of people who were guides or teachers or or counselors or mentors or these kind of things who you know when I was ready for the next challenge I could go to them and they'd say try this and then I you know I would go do it or I would fight with it or whatever but the point is whether you're whether you've always been solid like I've talked to a lot of people on this podcast it was just like yeah like I just did a good job always I haven't I haven't been a knucklehead. I've just done a good job my whole life. That's why I'm ahead of the game. And then I talk to people. It's like, yeah, man, I was a total piece of shit and my life was a mess. <laughs> right. And then a decision or I discovered this thing and then now I'm on top of the game and that's why I'm ahead because I got strong from that. But yep, coming from where I'm from where it's like, okay, you know, I, I've been in some dark places and then I fought to get out and now I've learned a lot of things. And that's what I joined Twitter too. I joined last year and it, it was all mm-hmm. just about I, – I know I have something to offer. I know I have something to share and I want to come give it to these people. And no, I wrote a book. I, I did a lot of these things that allowed me to put a lot of what I knew. Where'd you go? Okay. No, I thought I lost you for a second. Sorry. No. Yeah, we're good. We're good. But the point is, um, I just like, I relate a lot to what you're saying about. Right. You know, what, except one half of my life, essentially my adult life was spent on the destructive side, myself sure. and the stuff around me. And now the other half has been spent turning that around and then becoming something more than I, than I was by a long shot and being something exceptional instead, because I fought so hard. I have all the tools. I have the strength. So now I'm here to share. There was one thing you, there was one kind of course of discussion that I wanted to touch on because it's something that's been interesting me a lot. And you talked about how um, you sort of discovered that you needed to weave a story that people could relate to. And you still wanted to tie in the same information. You still wanted to be genuine and from the heart, but you had Mm -hmm. to put it in a vehicle that people wanted to take a ride with you in. And so I'm wondering um, sort of what, what was the process of you waking up to that and discovering who it is that you wanted to speak as? I mean, I know you touched on it a little bit, and, I, right. and then I wonder what might you tell anybody else who seeking to strike that same balance where they have a character that works for them and is effective in getting the message across, but the message is true and it's true to the, who they are and it doesn't clash with their principles. Right. Um, I think, you know, I think I have to go back to, you know, touch on a couple of things you said. Um, I, I had a lot of great mentors in my life. Um, and I feel like I was, I was very lucky and blessed. One, um, my whole family, from my great-grandparents to my grandparents, to my own parents, to my older brother, uh, just from the restaurant experience, uh, having that. I, I, I wasn't a fuck-up as a kid. Uh, I, I, I wish I had, a, I wish I had a, a good story to tell. Sometimes I, I listen to other people's stories and uh, who was – did this, who was, you know, somebody who just was down and out like yourself, like you're saying. And I, I hear those stories and, and, and it, they truly inspire me. Uh, and why, and the reason why they inspire me, okay, is because I feel like I had such great mentors and most people who've had a, a pretty straight, straight edge life just can't relate and they say fuck it and they just keep doing their own thing and they don't try to help other people Hmm. because sometimes they don't think they can help someone else because they never had a story they never been there before um i feel the opposite 
I feel because I've had this straight edge life, I feel like because of the people that were in front of me and the people that have mentored me, I think the only way that I can fulfill their legacy and make them proud of me is by one, teaching my children without a doubt to stay on the same path, but then also taking it to other people who might need that help. People who didn't walk the straight line and say, well, this is what I did. This is what you can do. I know you have the capability in it because I don't feel I'm not anything special myself. I, I'm not anything special or exceptional or, or, or anything else. I don't believe I'm better than any other man. I mean, you've heard me tweet that before and I've said it. What my father always taught me was there's no man above you or below you. You're not better than anyone. No one is better than you. So when you go through life in that fashion, you, then you're really, you're, again, it goes back to nature. You're connected to nature. Logos. You're connected to the truth. Okay? And that's the biggest problem today. Most people are not connected to the truth. Mm. People are connected to fucking political nonsense, political correct bullshit and narratives of just nonsense. and. That's why I find that sometimes the things that I do say on my Twitter and people get back, wow, great take on that. I never thought of it that way. And I'm sitting there scratching my head going, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> the, you know, not, not, not belittling them, meaning, but that's the way it's fucking supposed to be done. Like, you know, like it's just, it's just it, you know? Um, and it, it looks like this, people are just so disconnected from that. Uh, and I felt like I, I feel good throwing my voice in the ring and saying the things that I do is definitely going to, you know, bring some people back to who they should be or rise them up from where the, the bad place that they're at. Um, they say to find your own voice. And it goes back to what I said about being a fig don't be a figazi. You, you really have to stop. And that, then that comes from a fact of, not worrying about what people think or say about you because back again, being the doctor, putting on the white coat, you know, I felt like I had to act a certain way or less people were going to say things and, and they expected a certain thing from me. And, and you can't live your life in that fashion. It doesn't work. You're never going to, it doesn't matter. Even if you achieve billions in riches, if you, if whatever it is you have, if you achieve certain, whatever, whatever it is, if you, especially money, you're never going to be fulfilled because you're still living a life according to what, what you, sh you feel other people, uh, how you should be living yourself according to their standard, not your own. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to attain wealth. Money is great. Who wouldn't want to be a billionaire? <laughs> but it's not how much money you have. It's how you made that money. So, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, you read about gangsters. People are, uh, and I think, I think one of the attractions to me is, I guess they kind of associate me with fucking mafia movies and shit like that. Um, I'm here to let you understand something. That's the, I'm the farthest away from that. I'm so almost anti against that. My father was a guy who grew up in his neighborhood. If you saw the movie of Bronx Tale, do you see you saw the movie of Bronx Tale? If not, you better go watch the movie of Bronx Tale. <laughs> the movie of Bronx Tale um, uh, is actually a story about my family's neighborhood, the restaurant where we're at in the 50s and 60s. Mm. So that kind of really tells a story of like my father's childhood and how he grew up. And then I caught the tail end of it in the 70s and mid 80s. Those same type of people always growing up with these neighborhood guys and all this kind of stuff. And I grew up too in my father's bar. So a lot of the stuff I do talk about is lessons I did learn in the four walls of my family's restaurant inside of a bar from a lot of shady kind of characters and, <laughs> and, and how to be. My father was one of the only guys, all his friends that he hung out with, my father, let's, 
my father was the only guy who was basically legit, mm. stood as he was. He never got into any life with no one because he knew from a very young age that it's a nowhere life. It's a life of bullshit. It's a life of fakeness. It's a life of you have to be only, you owe somebody else something all the time. Somebody's just trying to get something from you. Once you start connecting and, you know, the, 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 the wise guy movies glorify all this stuff. And I understand why, because it can be very, wow, these guys are cool and all that kind of shit. But there's a real flip side to it that, you know, every, here's how to explain. <laughs> Everybody watches the gangster movies and they all talk about everything that happens up to the last 20 minutes of the gangster movie. Because usually in the last 20 minutes of the gangster movie is either they get whacked, they wind up in jail, <laughs> and everybody forgets that. Their life falls apart. So everybody likes to talk about the, the fun stuff up until the reality. So that's the reality of, of that life. And my father knew it from a very young age. He, he, um, and he never got involved. It looked like he did because he looks like a character right out of like the Sopranos, uh -huh. my father looked like. Um, but he never got involved. He just went home every night, went to sleep, didn't get involved in no bullshit. He didn't want to. I'll tell you a quick story about my father. And this is, this is a, a testament to character. Um, in 1983, my father decided we used to have the restaurant used to be like a hangout bar and a restaurant side. And the bar was his life. He stood behind the bar his, his whole life and um, always loved being around the guys and making drinks, talking a lot of bullshit and all that kind of craziness. And in 1983, he comes home and tells my mother, and I was 13, my, father, my brother was about 16 or 17, tells my mother that he's closing the bar. Closing the bar? He's selling the restaurant? What are you doing? No, 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 no. He goes, I'm, I'm just getting rid of the bar. I'm just going to have a whole restaurant. My mother's like, what are you talking about? First of all, this is like hundreds of thousands of dollars going in the toilet. And my mother was like, my mother didn't really care about the money. What, what, what are you talking about? What? Are you, what what's the matter? Younger guys started coming up and they just started being fuck ups. They started, not dis, they started disrespecting the place, disrespecting the neighborhood. And he says, I'm out. I, I have my two sons. I don't want them around this shit. I grew up around it. I had to deal with these, with these idiots. My sons are not going to deal with these, get, with these people as they grow up anymore. And my father, boom, closed it one day, decided when the story went out in the neighborhood that he was closing the bar. Um, first, he was called a traitor in the neighborhood for closing up the bar. There's <laughs> a, lot of sh a lot of shit went down in, that, in, in there. And two guys showed up to my father, Ralph, my father's Ralph also, Ralph can't close the ball, you know, this and that. We always wanted to, 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 to give you a taste of what went on and the things that we did. You know, we're still willing to do that. They brought a suitcase. They presented the suitcase to my father. They opened it for him. Inside the suitcase was $100 bills all over the place, money. Ralph, this is for you. Don't close the bar. And then there's going to be more to come. My father looked at them. He shut the, shut the suitcase, pushed it back towards them and said, gentlemen, I'm out. I'm finished. I don't need that money. I want to go home every night. I just want to live my life and that's it. And they walked out and they walked away. My father was called a traitor. Like I said, betrayed the neighborhood like he gave a shit. Um, and that's who my father was. That's the kind of man that he was. And that's the character that he had. The money didn't mean anything to him. Even though like 20 years uh, later, he said, you know, I should have took that money. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but he, he, he was only kidding. He would have never, he would have never been happy living his life that way. Again, living a false life that he didn't, he didn't grow up with and he never wanted for himself or for his family. So that's how, you know, I looked at that example. And I say, I'm not going to be a fuck up. I went to school. I was a baseball player. I played high school, college baseball, semi-professional. I played until I was 35 years old. And uh, that's, that's where I was all the time. I was on a baseball field. If, if, if I had my perfect life, right now I'd probably be 
a friend of mine who actually I play ball with, he's actually now the senior scout for the Milwaukee Brewers. Mm. Once in a while, I see him every once in a while, my college friend. Um, every once in a while, I talk to him on, on social media. And I tell him, bro, you have my life. And he laughs. <laughs> I said, I, sh- I, sh- I should have I stuck with you and I should have went your route. Because truthfully, that's, that's probably where I would love to be every single day of my life uh, on, on a baseball field. If I had my choice, that would be it. If, if my Twitter was maybe 25 years ago, all I'd probably be talking about was baseball on my Twitter. I'd have a baseball Twitter account. <laughs> so, you know, you got to find your voice. You got you to you gotta look back on your principles, how you were raised, look at those things. I was lucky enough to have two good parents, to have a really good life. I know a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't, didn't have a good father or a good mother or they, were, they come from a broken home and all that kind of stuff. And I, I couldn't imagine not growing up without a good dad, without a good mom. I, I just, it, it, I, I can't, you know, that's why I say I just feel like just paying it forward and, and, and just trying to put myself in. But I would never try to tell somebody who never had a good dad, oh, come on, you know, just man up. I understand, but you know what? Sometimes you got to get past it and you got to, now it's time to like move on and become the man that maybe your father wasn't. And if you're going to have children, become that man. Don't do just because of what your past is doesn't mean it has to be your present and it definitely doesn't have to be your future. So that, that's, that's a big, that's a big thing. You got to change that, change that pattern in, in your legacy, whatever you got from, from your bloodline, change that, change that pattern, make it sort of good legacy right from this moment and, and go forward. You know, I really identify with what you're talking about. In fact, almost everything I've ever written in long form has involved harping and harping and harping on principles on your right. code. And it's not like I've tried to make clear always too. I'm not here to tell you how to live your fucking life. You can live it how you want to. What I'm trying to say is that you need to know what your rules of engagement are, the way that you play this game of life. You need to know the rules that you're playing by. I need you to look at them and you need to say, absolutely is this this really who i am because if you don't if you don't look i don't care who you are if you're not hurting anybody i don't care what you do with your life you could do anything absolutely (laughs) wherever you want you can as long as you're not forcing anything on anyone either don't force your shit or force that somebody should accept you for a certain way that's bullshit that's where i cross my line Uh, you know i live and live but don't don't tell me who, uh, because I don't accept something, that I'm a certain kind of person because I don't accept it. That's bullshit. That, that's political correct nonsense. And you can't, you can't speak to that. Any man who's, who doesn't, any man who speaks political correctness to me is not a man. You just, you, you're a fucking liar, okay? Um, women and children could do that for the moment. Men can't do that shit. Men are the... The, 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 the backbone of, of society, the backbone of culture, the backbone of family, the backbone of what the world really is. And men have to keep that in line. Once you start walking, once men start walking away from the truth, this is the society that we have right now, that mainstream nonsense. But that's why there's such a big divide in, in the cultural realm and the culture war that's going on between men and women, between political shit and left and right, because we have this, this whole divide. There's some people who are speaking the truth, some people who aren't, and both hate each other for it. So yeah. there has to be some, some but the people got to start speaking the truth. Just truth isn't hate, you know. Um, truth is just reality. And if, you, and if you believe it's hateful or it hurts you, then you should, you should really wake up and see what's going on there. You know? Yeah, man, look, I'm making this podcast. You're appearing on this podcast. The whole episode. This is a great, this is a great thing. Cause I saw all the people you got in here too. So good stuff. Yeah. And the whole, the whole emphasis of this thing is I'm talking to people and I'm trying to pull stuff out of them. That's, that's going to be like, it's here's, here's Ralph and he's telling his story. And I'm trying to pull useful bits out of it. And I'm imagining, right. you know, I want to connect with you as a person. And I want the people who listen to this to be better for having listened to it. And I have a certain view of the world and it's grounded in reality. It's grounded in yep. the fact to the best of my knowledge. And I do read, I do research. I admit when I'm wrong 
and when an expert, like I've admitted that I'm wrong on this very podcast, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, maybe look at it that right. right. That's, that's part of being a man too. It's like, you can't, it's not about just claiming that you have authority or that you have the right, right way all the time. It's sticking up for what you know is right. But if you're presented with evidence that shows you without a doubt that what you're talking about is incorrect, you say, right. Abso- absolutely. If, if that's, that's the one that's, um, well, again, it goes back to what uh, uh, kind of, I don't know, what a man really is. A man is not supposed to be, men are supposed to talk about ideas. Men are supposed to exchange ideas. Men are supposed to sit around and not be emotional about the ideas that are exchanged um, or forced those ideas on someone else. Let's talk about it. Here's the situation. This is what we should do. This is the kind of thing that, sh- this is the outcome that needs to happen. Um, and see where it goes from there and not turn around and say, Oh no, well you're this and you're that. I, I don't know. That's, you know, I didn't like, again, I go back to like w- what I learned from growing up in, in my father's bar and seeing these, these characters in the neighborhood, how they handled situations. Um, and things with people sat down and things were talked about and solutions came from it without hard feelings. Um, and sometimes you just gotta, if you were wrong, you gotta fucking eat it and smile and understand that you fucked up and you have to go rectify the shit that you fucked up and you got to make sure you make good on it. Or otherwise that's not a man. You gotta, you gotta be a man of your word. If you did something wrong, you gotta say, Hey, all right, I fucked up and this is how we're going to fix it. Not if you did something wrong and then start blaming every other fucking person for your, for your shit. Uh, uh, you know what? Again, I hate to say, you go back, women do that, whatever, it's their nature. For, and you know what? It's never going to, I don't think that's ever going to change, <laughs> but we still have to call women on it. We still have to call them on their bad behavior. I have two young daughters. I call them all the time on their bad behavior. I don't let them get away with shit. If they fucked up, sorry, you fucked up. I don't give a shit, but he did, but she, she said, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear it. Okay. Same. When a man does it, as soon as a man starts, my son, I do what my son, as soon as my son starts going, well, he, I, I, it's, I, it's a different tone than with my two daughters. Would you just say, I, I go off on him. Don't you ever dare blame the teacher or some a friend. You did what you did. You're a man. You own up to that bullshit. And you know what? If you got to go apologize, you go apologize. And that's it. That's what a man does. And that's what you need to be. Okay, that's exactly what I tell my son. He doesn't like it. Too bad. <laughs> you got you got to be that way. And it, I just want to chuck in right now that an apology should not be confused with a sorry. Oh, you know, absolutely. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Sorry is like you know, um, kind of, you know, I fucked you over and sorry about that. Whereas an apology, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. I love to write, and part mm-hmm. of that part of that love was awakened in my ninth grade class. I had a great, right. had a great English teacher and that, that English teacher, I almost didn't have the privilege of having him as a teacher because um, I made a joke about his wife. You still there? Yeah. 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 All right. I made a no, joke. Sorry, about- I just got a text. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Good. Go ahead. I, compared, right, I got you. I compared, a, I compared his wife to like a, I don't know, an old lady. Yeah. It was, it was <laughs> And I made a joke and he got fucking pissed about it. Right. What did you say? And I was, uh, you know, I was like, well, I'm already busted. I might as well just go with it. I was like, yeah, you know, it's not my fault, whatever, that your wife right. is old and you got mad about it. Get out yeah, of here. Yeah. Go down to yeah. the office and you're out of my class. So I went to the office. They said, did you try apologizing? I was mm-hmm. like, well, I, I had no intention of doing that. I didn't really right. feel like I did it wrong. It was just a joke. <laughs> now go down and apologize to him. We're not going to put you in another class to apologize. I thought about I thought about just telling him I well okay, I guess I'll just not go to class then that'll be cool. Right. <laughs> I, I was like you know what, I was in the wrong. It was a dick move. I'm just gonna be on there and I and right. I, I look you know I don't know your wife. I don't know anything about her, but I shouldn't talk about her like that. You know it's it's just disrespectful and this is a school and et cetera et cetera. Just been a, in a minute. They right. said well no Mr. Lunsford, um. I think it took a lot of balls to come down here and apologize to me like that. And, uh, you know, you're welcome back in my class. We don't have to kick you out and just, um, don't disrespect me for my class like that again. And we'll get along just fine. 
And he well, was that's that's how you gain ultimate respect as a man when you um when you own up to 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 your shortcomings. You you fucked up and you say, "Listen, uh yeah, I, this was stupid." More, every other man who understands what being a man is is going to 1000% respect that. Is going to 1000% accept your apology because that's what men do and that's what it that's how you keep a, a society and a culture stable if you have a bunch of crazy men then you have a lot of problems that's well and you know again i, I go back to even though my father you know the gangsters and shit like that that's what they were and i kind of learned that aspect from from them they don't. They didn't want craziness. Craziness brings other problems. So whenever people screwed up, they had to be said set straight. And if they weren't set straight, then there was other things that happened to those people. Yeah. <laughs> but whatever, you know. And it it happened because the guy wouldn't. Somebody just wouldn't own up to up, up to their shit. And we can't have craziness around and whatever happened to them happened to them. So, <laughs> you know, <It> whatever, <laughs> whatever the, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, you, you talk about it cause I don't try to, I don't like to glorify it and I don't, I don't try to say it to make it sound impressive or to make myself sound impressive that I was around, around that stuff. Because like I said, I don't really, I'm so far removed from, from that. And I, you know, I just, it's, it's, it is what it is, you know, but like, again, reality, you have to understand there is a reality of it. And, um, and you know, they made sure they just kept their neighborhood safe and, 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 and things going right. So that, that's, that's a good thing. It's one good thing that com comes from it. A lot of other stuff is all bad shit, but it's one good thing that comes from that lifestyle that they had, making sure everybody's checking each other to make sure they're not doing stupid shit, even if they were kind of rivals or whatever it might be. Yeah. Well, look, man, I, I, I ran with a crew that didn't have even that kind of respect for the neighborhood. It wasn't even right. about, that. it was, a, it was about being, it was about causing trouble and bringing destruction. Right. Every, every one of the people I rolled with hated life. If you know, yeah, that's not time. good. That lots sucks. of people died and lots and lots of bad shit was done. And, you know, so. Well, glad uh, you're out of it. Me too. And you, you, you changed it and you understand. That's a good thing. It's one of those things where, you know, people, <laughs> people want to act hard. Um, but it's like, you don't like, <laughs> I know I look like a big dork and I am a big dork in a lot of ways, but I've seen some shit and I've been some places, dude. It's, sure. not, it's not like, it is what it is. And it's, and I don't want to make it seem cool either. Those are my right. darkest things. Those are the things I always yeah. talk about, you know, at my, you. Most, at my most foolish at my most problematic. This is what I was doing. But some of these guys on the internet who want to, you can tell, it's just like, dude, shut up. You know, yeah, no, it's whatever. <laughs> well, you, you saw, did you see the, the tweet kind of like I put out today about, um, and I got, I, I definitely pissed off a few people, uh, that you have to, you have to at some point, you know, get out of the group. You have to walk away from the red pill and the manosphere. You have to start formulating your, I, I, you know, well, you, you formulate tweets to get a rise out of people sometimes and to make them think also. Sure. Most, of the, most of the things that I do is I, I try to make them think a little bit. And sometimes it gets you thinking when it pisses you off a little bit. So I basically said, you because... Because 99%, and it's, this is true, 99% of the people inside those little groups are fucking bottom-feeding douchebags. Yeah. I, I've kind of interacted with them. I'm like, yo, I don't know. You're a fucking 20-year-old kid trying to tell me about, like, women and all this kind of, bro, you, you don't know nothing. Just because you read this shit in books and on a red pill Reddit fucking, you know, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is how you're going to fucking live your life? I go, take that shit and then go out and experience. Yeah. And from your experience, is when, and then a couple of guys kind of, I said, when that thing called me on it, and then I gave the explanation. I go, I said, this is, I'm going to explain it to you very simple. Every great philosopher in life, and even you could talk about it, scientists also, every great philosopher or scientist at some point broke away from the pack 
and form their own opinion. That's why you know their names because they decided to do, take what they had, the basis, and then form their own shit, wrote their own books, wrote their own philosophy book, did their own scientific experimentations and did that kind of stuff. The ones who just stuck to the dogma, you don't know who they are. You don't know their name. They're just still talking the same shit, okay, 50 years later and talking about the same shit that everybody else is talking about. At some point, you have to turn around and say, I got it. Here's the basis. But again, it goes back to, here's my principles and values. This is how I look at this. This is from my experiences in life. This is what I do. And I'm going to do my thing. And I'm not going to put out a tweet or say something to a certain, in a manner, or I'm not going to interact with female accounts on Twitter and agree with them because I'm afraid that some guy, some higher up guy in the, in the manosphere, Red Pill, is going to look at my tweet and go, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. I don't give a shit. <laughs> you, got, you got the wrong guy. Okay, here. I wasn't taught that way. Uh, you, I don't give a shit. I, I don't care what you think about me. If I agree with that woman's tweet about men, fucking live with it. It's too bad because she's right half the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry. That's her experience. So that, that's the way you got you to gotta accept it. And that's it. Mm. You know, this is, something I, this is something I've talked about. This is something I've written about. Um, the red pill. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that this community is there because. Absolutely. You know, that's a part of development. When you wake up and realize that the world is yep. a place that is full of harsh realities. And not all of them are comfortable. In fact, there's a lot of shit out there that's very uncomfortable. But you, it's like, well, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to cry about it? Are you going to be a baby about it? Or are you just going to accept it and then make yourself strong enough to be able to deal with that? Are you going to be a right. man or are you going to be a little boy? You know, like you talked about. That's a man, a man looks at the world around him. He recognizes the reality of a situation. And then he becomes something more than the reality requires of him to survive. It's not just survive. It's thrive. Right lead absolutely it's prosper it's all those things and, and the when, only way you get to that next level is by you know taking the ground surface the, the 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 foundation that you learn and forming your own way and go and moving up damn right you know it's funny his his the uh a lot of people find find the internet or the self on the internet or instagram or whatever a lot of people find the self-improvement stuff through gary vaynerchuk to Gary V. Sure. Gary V, I, I followed Gary V from his very beginning um, and read some of his books and all that kind of stuff. Like Gary V is like the entry level, like self development. You got to keep doing it. You got to keep moving forward. He's, he's been saying the same fucking thing for the past 10 years, which is great because yeah. that's how new people find him. And then those people who actually want to finally go, okay, I get it. <laughs> we want them to find us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <'Cause> <laughs> so they, they go, do that. yeah, the next level. That's okay. Right. You know, Gary, I'm not just trying to belittle him. This guy's, guy's a fucking man, bro. He's got millions of people and he's helped, he's inspired. But he's like the entry level. He's, 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 the, he's the gateway drug to, <laughs> to the, the self development, the, the good, the feel good stuff. I mean, he curses, but. If you listen to his story, it's really like, feel, you got to move and you got to do and you got to, but you could do it and all that kind of, which is great. You have to have that foundation because if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe that you're, you're capable, if you don't believe that you can, you won't. It's just never going to happen. So you got you to gotta be in that, in that situation. When you find that and then you find that you finally you believe in yourself and you know you can do it and you know you have the capability, now what? Okay. Oh shit. You mean I'm going to fucking fail and I'm going to get fucked up and I'm not going to, everything's not going to be as perfect to, uh, on my path and on my journey. And you mean that's a good thing? Yeah, that's absolutely a good thing because you're going to fail. Failure is the gateway to success. It's, there's no, there's no doubt about it. You have to get kicked in the fucking face <laughs> 10,000 times and you have to get kicked in the teeth and you have to, 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 to roll around in the fucking dirt and the mud and the blood. Um, I get that, I get that old school mental toughness 
my great grandparents decided to open a fucking restaurant in the twenties. Think about the time period. Yeah, fucking depression. Great Depression, Prohibition. Well, not that many people listen to Prohibition anyway, but it was still a time of being held down. There wasn't a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of upward mobility at that moment. <clears throat> they persevered. They went through it. They went through, think about from 1927 when the, our restaurant was open to two, 2019. Just look at the history. Look at the economic history. Let's talk about economics. Ups, downs, ins, outs, stock market crashes, uh, 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 Black Fridays, all these kind of things that kind of went on. Different presidents all through different wars, up and down. My family lasted through the whole thing. And it, and it still went on and it's still going on. The last, in the last couple of years in the restaurant, it hasn't been so great. But you know what? We sit there and we go, all right, it's okay. We know what we have to do to get through. Don't start fucking, one of the, here's one thing, the, one of the biggest, sometimes the biggest mistakes you can make when the shit hits the fan is all of a sudden decide to change everything. Mm. Sometimes you just got to realize what's going on and say, you know what, let's, you might have to just ride it out. I know you listen to the online guys and the Guys selling their, their Shopify stores and shit. Or you got a, you got a new ad, new, new headline, new this, new that. And how many people fail? I could see it because they, they, don't get three, they don't get one sale for two days in a row. They go and fucking revamp their whole website and change the copy. And I'm like, no, man. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just not, it's not just jiving. Okay, so you go and change everything and people lose their businesses. I got a good story right there. In The Godfather, the movie The Godfather, okay? You saw, you saw The Godfather, right? Of course. You know, you know when, in the restaurant where Michael shoots Salazzo and the cop? Yeah. Remember that scene where he shoots him, he comes out of the bathroom with the gun behind the shit, and he shoots him? Okay. That restaurant was on Gun Hill Road in the Bronx, the real restaurant. They shot it in the real restaurant. It was on Gun Hill Road in the Bronx. Uh... It was pretty famous, pre pretty good restaurant at the time when, when the movie, before the movie came out. After the movie came out, the guy really started, got busy, got really busy. You know what he decided to do? He's a fucking idiot. He, he remodeled his whole restaurant. Ugh. When people walked in, they were like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> he was out of business within a year. Uh. He changed the whole fucking, people came to see where the guy got shot in the head in the movie. Yeah. He, changed it. he took the pull chain toilet out, he, everything. He got stupid. So sometimes you just got to sometimes leave everything alone. Sometimes you got to ride out the wave. Sometimes you ride out the bad wave. And, and that's sometimes that's the thing you have to do. You have to recognize too, you got to, you know, look at the whole situation. What's going on? Why is it not busy? Why are we not succeeding? Do an inventory. What, what, are we doing anything wrong? Doesn't seem like we're doing anything wrong. I don't know. What the hell? We've been doing the same shit. Look at the times around you, economic times, this, that, the other thing. Adapt. You got it. Sometimes just adapting and thriving. That's what you have to do. You just don't rush to like change the whole shit. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why my family's business has stood um, for 92 years at this point. They just, nobody ever really panicked. Um, and there was a lot of times fucking reasons to panic, <laughs> a lot of reasons to panic. Um, so, you know, just, just don't, don't just assess everything. Don't, don't, not uh, boom, decide, oh, we got to change everything. Things aren't good. Boom. And it's like everything in life, relationships, marriages, friendships. Uh, he's not paying attention to me. Fuck him. I'm getting a divorce. You know, I'm going to go talk to this guy because he told me whatever. Say, <laughs> sometimes you just got to step back and, and think for two seconds, you know? Yeah, man. One of my specialties is strength training. You know, I'm mm -hmm. certified as a kettlebell trainer and an NASM trainer and stuff. And one thing people always do is the same thing you're talking about. They always try to like, well, I'm just going to do a totally new thing. It's like, no, you misunderstand how this works. It's, it's period. <laughs> Aggressive resistance training, meaning like you push for a while and then you and then you reach and you pull back a little bit and then you push. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get like if you're first starting, you're trying to get to like 105 percent 
of where you started. You know, maybe even a hundred yesterday. yesterday yeah. you wanted to be there. <laughs> not not in three months. You want to be there yesterday. You want to have the six pack, the big body. I, yeah, I go through the same thing with my chiropractic patients. It's a, and it's a good, <clears throat> but if something's going wrong, I always tell people pick one variable and change that, and, right? And 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 see what happens. You know, do it long enough that you can get an accurate rep, or accurate representation of the consequences of changing that variable, whether it's right. with whether it's with your diet, whether it's with your writing habits, whether it's with a bad habit, you know, like what are you doing and what are you not doing? Just pick one thing. Cause especially let's say you're trying to change your life. Let's say you're overweight. Let's say you're a smoker. Let's say you play three hours of video games a night. Let's say that um, you're beaten yep. off three times a day or whatever, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, that could be overwhelming. If like, let's say you didn't want to do any of those you, things. You can't you get rid of all four at once. You can't. No, and, and not only that, you can't even get rid of one of them without replacing it with something yeah. because you've, you've made the space right. in your life. What are you going to do? What are you going to do if you're just like, I'm not going to smoke now? Well, what are you going to do? Because you've been, you've been taking eight minutes, a, you know, 10 times a day. Right. You, oh, I went through, you know, that brings it. I went through, I put out a tweet about a month ago about people with low back pain issues and how they should just, you know, they should walk, do some body weight squats. And sometimes that'll just help them get over the pain. Hmm. A couple of a couple of muscle head bodybuilding douchebags were trying yeah. to were really trying to convince me and tell me that what the advice I was given was bullshit, and that I should go read some doctor bodybuilder blog. And I went, no, you could read that fucking blog. I don't need to read it. I have other resources. And they couldn't understand that. Because that, I guess that was, that's their guru. And I'm like, I understand that's your guy. That's not my guy. You could go read him. I don't, if he's, if he's telling me, if he's trying to tell me. And what, I said, somebody, one of my patients who has a fucking herniated disc, pain down their leg, that they should start doing fucking deadlifts. I'm not listening to that jerk off. That guy has no idea what he's talking about. Believe me when I tell you, I'm 20 years in practice. He doesn't know jack shit. Oh, his, what, his blog is read by millions. I don't give a shit. I was, I was going back and forth. I don't care. And they couldn't wrap their head around that I did not care about this guy's blog. It just pissed them off. Hmm. Your advice is stupid. I said, listen, I don't care. I've been doing this for 20 years. You have to start. You have to meet people where they're at. I'm going to give somebody with a hot disc and pain down their leg. Yeah, go, go to the gym and start fucking deadlifting. I, get my, I should have my license taken away as a doctor. How am I helping that patient? First, they have to c control that pain. Then they could go eventually. But, you know, they, they're trying to convince me. I, you know, it's just it's so stupid. I can't. All right. Sorry. I just had to tell that story. Hey, I, look, as I, I'm trying to develop some maturity around the area, but when I see some stupid shit on Twitter, damn it. If I just, I can't. It's, I, it's, yeah, I can't I, let it go. I know I, I have that I, problem too. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Would you would you stop coming with this bullshit? This is not yeah. okay. Okay, chance. All right, you can't you can't fix him. You can't fix him. Just chill yeah, out. Billy Roberts is gonna come that, tell you not to do this. <laughs> yeah, that that's the one thing you gotta you gotta realize. Some people you're never gonna you're never gonna get through to them. Yeah. And you know what, Twitter too. You gotta understand. So uh, you know, I forget sometimes too. Social media is full of uh, just people oh, trying to be polarizing and trolling. Yeah. Some guy some guy put out a thing that that his tip. To restaurant workers, to fucking waiters, my tip, I don't tip. My tip is I tell them to go get a fucking real job. I fucking, yo, I went, he's some big Twitter guy. I, I told him, fuck you right on his fucking bed. I don't give a shit. <laughs> don't you ever fucking dare talk about a restaurant worker. You don't know where they're coming from. You have no idea who they are. They're some of the greatest people I've ever met. There's people who make plenty of money. People worked in my family's restaurant. I have a guy who was a waiter who worked in my family's restaurant for 40 years. He worked. He put his three kids through college. He has 15 grandchildren. He's 94 years old. He's still alive. He has a, you're going to tell me that guy didn't thrive being a fucking waiter? And that's all he was. Okay? Don't fucking talk to me about that. You don't know shit. Go fucking in your online store and go see where you got to fucking go. go. Go sell some shit from China and leave me the fuck alone. Okay? I deal in the real world. Okay? That's it. You know, so I just, uh, this, there's some, some, I have some hot buttons. You start talking about restaurant workers. No, 
<laughs> I, I don't go for that shit. Hey, I, like I said, I worked in restaurants. I know the jam. I mean, yeah. there's there's some dip shits in the restaurants. Oh, absolutely. You know, <laughs> absolutely. You know? absolutely. The, the stereotype is 1,005 million percent real, without a doubt. But there's yeah. some really solid, solid people that work in, in the restaurant industry, man. And the, yeah. some of them make it a lot. They don't realize it. They're making a lot of fucking money waiting on tables and bartending. Okay, yeah. more than fucking people who got Wall Street fucking degrees or whatever they're working on. And, and they're doing very well for themselves. Very well. And they listen, not for nothing, but cash money ain't reportable. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't talk, we don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't know what you just said. I have no idea. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't I didn't know what I was talking about for a lot of years. Dude, I still don't know what I'm talking about half the time. Come on. (laughs) So look, this is a lot of poop, poop, poop. (laughs) We've been going. We've been going now for a little over an hour. Yep. We've. I I feel like I could just. And I really appreciate this about you because I'm very much the same way and I have to rein it in for the podcast so I can listen yeah. to my, but I feel like I could just put a quarter in you and get you to rant about anything for, I'll for probably stand time. there for five more fucking hours and, and, and go through fucking everything. <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah. That's, we can do that another day. That's what I'm saying. I'd love to have you back on here. Um, but you know, we're, we're kind of, it's, it's late where you're at and we've covered a lot of ground and there's a lot for people to digest. Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. So, <laughs> Maybe if we could just give them one more thing. And, you know, we've been talking back and forth and listening to each other, but a lot of people listen to this podcast more and more all the time. And, and, you know, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast, listen to every episode. I've got some, I got some devoted fans at this point. Cool. Cool. That's awesome, man. Good. Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm humbled and honored by it. And, and most of them are young men and most of them make something we want. Yes. That's what we want. That's what we need. We need some people to 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 write the ship. So absolutely, considering that, if you were sitting across from a from a twenty something year old man who was looking to clean some stuff up in his life and looking to make some moves and 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 you know right. flex a little bit, what right. would you tell them was the one or two things that they needed to make sure that they continued to move forward and build the life that they imagined they could live? Well, co- well, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Where should we start? It's another hour and a half. No, no. Um, one, I'll go from my own experience, being a young guy, realize you don't know shit and you ain't shit. You haven't experienced nothing yet. Mm-hmm. So when, when somebody older than you or more experienced than you starts talking to you, you perk up, you take your eyes, lock your eyes right on them and listen to every fucking word that they said and digest all of it. I wish I would have did more of that when I was younger. All right. We all go through that as, as men, young boys, little boys. Ask, I don't know, fucking shit. What is he talking? I'm the fucking man. You know what? Even you could still think that way about yourself and that's okay. Because to me, I think you should think about your way when you're 18 years old. You should think that about yourself. That you are the fucking man. But in order to be the real man, you got to learn from those older guys or older people and learn from their experiences. Lock on them. Listen to what they have to say, digest it, ask every question that you can when they're talking to you. Uh, I think that's like the main number one thing that they should do. And, and not only should you listen, you should actually go and seek it out. Go and ask people their advice. Go and sit with the older guys and, and find out what their life, how they came up, what they did. You will be so far ahead of the game. It's not, it's not even... You, 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 then your friends or your peer group, if you're an 18-year-old guy, 20-year-old guy, even, even if you're 30, 30-year-old guy, you start talking to people that are 30 years older than you and have been through all the shit, you fucking take notes and, and, and do all that kind of stuff, you will be so far ahead and not make those mistakes and maybe be able to write your ship and maybe you will never have to write your ship, you'll just stay on that path and that's what you really want to do. Yeah. Um, the one thing I always leave people with um, is, is, you know, y- your legacy is, is the most important thing that you have. What you leave behind to the next person, and it doesn't have to be to a whole group of people. You don't have to go out and write books or have Twitter accounts or be some guru. Just to one person, your children, 
you, if you don't have children, to, to, to just some people you might mentor, you have to leave something behind to, to, to make their lives a little bit better. And if your life isn't great at this moment, just because you have a past, your past doesn't define your present or your future. I said that before. You could change your legacy starting right at this moment at any age, whether you're 16, 26, 36, 56, 86. You could make that shit right. You could do it today. You have one life to live, one story to create, one legacy to leave behind. Start doing that shit today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. It's important. Hell yeah, man. Absolutely. I, that's, that's great. That's, there, it's, it's a trip. Not to get too deep into anything more, but there are certain things that happen on this podcast that happen over and over and over again. There's certain themes. There's certain, it's like, right. by the time I'm, you know, by the time I'm a hundred episodes in, all the secrets of the universe are going to be revealed to my <laughs> listeners. And, and it's like 10 secrets. It's just like 10 secrets that are just over and over again. Like, it. listen, you just do these things. You got it. And, and then we'll keep, and then we'll keep repeating them. Yeah, exactly. They need to, they need to be told. <laughs> they need to be told because right. people want to bury the truth and the reality. It's crazy. And it happens, it happens over and over again. And then there's yep. a few people like us who just try to point them in the right direction. Logos, the truth. Be one with nature. Be one with the truth. That's all you need. Exactly right. Align yourself yeah. with reality, my friends. Align yourself <laughs> with the truth. Align, align yourself with truth. Reality reveals itself. So look, man, I really appreciate you coming on here and taking the time. Oh, anytime, man. My pleasure. So, Dr. Raf Napolitano, why yep. don't you tell them where they can find you online and, uh, and all Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> Twitter account is the main place I hang out. Dr. Ralph Knapp is the, is the name there, profile name. I'm on Instagram. I don't know. I don't really, I don't know. I don't know about Instagram. That's fucking, I, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I'm posting selfies and shit. I'm almost embarrassed half the time. <laughs> but Dr. Ralph Knapp, I'm, I hang out there sometimes. Uh, you could reach me there. You can go to my website, join my email uh, list, drralphknapp.com. Uh, my YouTube channel, same thing. I have some videos up. Oh, I just got a phone call. Uh, I got some videos up there. Uh, Dr. Ralph Knapp is YouTube. Just search for my name, Dr. Ralph Knapp Latano. You find me all over the internet. When you're in New York, when you're in the Bronx and you fucking come and visit my city, if you don't come and have a fucking glass of wine with me or a fucking scotch or, or a bourbon, you're a piece of shit, plain and simple. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Come and see me. Come hang out in the restaurant. That's where we have a lot of fun all the time. Come see my family's legacy, man. It's awesome. Enjoy it. Would love to share it with all of you. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to leave this legacy of this Logos and Trivical podcast <laughs> right here out. <laughs>